Well, take your Bibles, if you would, and look with me at Luke 19, Luke 19. We will look at the 19th chapter of Luke right at the end, but also then head on into chapter 20. The scriptures tell us over and over again that the Lord himself is the one to whom every knee will bow. And in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is going to be a powerful demonstration of his authority so rich and so expressive and so vivid and so unassailable that all of the earth will know it. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, the text says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. One of my favorite preachers of yesteryear is Ebenezer Pemberton. He preached in the early, early 1700s. And with regard to this text, Matthew 16, 27, where it says that the Lord himself will come and reward every man according to his works, Pemberton says this, the scriptures represent this awful event in the most lofty and magnificent language. Amazing prodigies will usher in this illustrious day and proclaim the descent of our almighty judge. Continual tragedies will be acted upon the great stage of nature, and this lower world will be involved in universal confusion and disorder. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. The stars of heaven shall start from their exalted orbs and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Perpetual thunders shall roar from the lower regions of the air. The earth shall tremble and quake and the foundations of the hills shall be removed. And then shall appear the signs of the Son of Man in the heavens. He quotes Matthew 24 verse 30. He goes on in his sermon to say this, At this amazing sight, the inhabitants of the earth shall mourn, and the sinners in Zion shall be horribly afraid. In the midst of their perplexity and distress, the Son of Man shall descend in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will appear in the pomp and solemnity of an incarnate God and assume a glory and magnificence suitable to the dignity of his office. His personal glory will be inexpressibly great. His eyes will sparkle like flames of fire. His countenance shine with dazzling beams of majesty and beauty. And his whole body be bright and luminous beyond the sun in its meridian splendor. And then he makes this statement. He will also come in the glory of his heavenly father and be clothed with the authority of of the universal judge of the world. He will be clothed with the authority of the universal judge of the world. With regard to mankind and who Jesus Christ is, it has always come down to the issue of who is the ultimate authority. Mankind wants to speak for himself. Who has authority over the souls of men? Whose authority rules in moral matters of life or matters of religion or, for that matter, any notion of salvation? Whose authority should be considered eternally binding? Ultimate authority was always the pinpoint argument that every unbelieving person made against Jesus Christ when he was on the earth, and certainly that was the hot argument that Israel made from top to bottom against their Messiah. From the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, when he taught in the synagogues, everyone there saw the difference between their theological mentors and Jesus' own powerful teachings. In Matthew 7, verse 29, he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. All oh, the scribes had delegated authority. They spoke with authority over the people and they demanded things from the people and they expected the 
reverence and honor of the people for their learnedness and their religious position. But they noted, that is the people, noted immediately that when Jesus spoke, he wasn't quoting some rabbi before him. He wasn't looking to the Sanhedrin's interpretive elements of the law. He wasn't thinking through some logical argument that he had to make and carefully articulate. No, he just taught from his own person, God in human flesh, and he spoke and they noted it immediately as an authority above their mentors around them. And if that weren't enough, Jesus cast out evil spirits with a word, and they knew it was a matter of authority. In Mark chapter 1, verse 27, they were all amazed, and they debated amongst themselves, what is this? A man teaching with authority, and he commands even unclean spirits, and they obey him. And when he called the twelve together, Luke 9 records in verse 1, that he gave them power and authority over all the demons. The Jewish leaders leveled the public challenge against his claim to even forgive sins. I mean, everyone knew that if you told someone you forgave their sins, you were acting in the place of God. Everyone knew that sin was an eternal issue. That sin is an offense against a holy God and it can never go unpunished. So for someone to come and tell another human being when you're just a man that your sins are forgiven. This was a matter of ultimate eternal authority. And so the Jewish leaders put the challenge to Jesus. This fellow blasphemes. Matthew 9 verse 6 records that Jesus responded to them in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to this paralytic, rise and take up your bed and go home. It's always been an issue of who has the ultimate authority. He gave him authority to execute judgment, the Father did. He gave the Son authority as the Son of Man to execute all judgment. Jesus would say it in John 10, no one has taken my life away from me. I lay it down on my own initiative and I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. That was the commandment, he says, that he received from his father. And he later told the disciples, the very week we're studying here, when he got together with them, he said, all authority over all mankind has been given to me. I've been given authority over every soul by the father so that I may give eternal life. Matthew 28 records that Jesus said the same thing in the Great Commission. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go and make disciples. The Roman procurator Pilate would have been utterly stunned when Jesus said to him, You have no authority over me except it had been given you from above. That is the question. Whose word is eternally binding? Mankind runs around the earth and he just makes his claims and he rises up and he stands over men and he builds empires and he, he dominates and one culture comes against another and one warring military faction comes against another and these despotic leaders rule over people and smother them and stomp them into the ground and then others live in obscurity and who's going to say anything about their moral life if they live on their own doing whatever they want to do. But if the scriptures say that when Jesus comes, he's going to call all men to the bar of authority, and that is a claim to absoluteness. That's a claim to majestic authority, unassailable authority. That is a claim to the authority enough to confront and expose man's sinful behavior and the evil heart behind it. Who has the authority to judge those worthy of it? Well, that's what we find here as Jesus comes into Jerusalem. 
He never allowed any neutrality. He drew the line in the sand. It was, it was a line between him and all other so-called authorities. He had said in Luke eleven twenty three, 23, He who is not with me is against me. If you don't gather with me, you scatter. And you can imagine now that the, the highest ranking leaders of Israel, the Sanhedrin itself... They are at this point driven to madness with infuriation. They just cannot bind this man legally and bring the authority of the Sanhedrin down upon his head. It has been elusive to this point. In fact, the crowds loved his healing power, loved his compassion. They loved his preaching against the evil of the oppressive of one person against another. And though the crowds were fickle and self-interested, compassion was what they said he preached and they loved it. And though oppression was what Jesus preached against, one person dominating another as if they were above them, even the zealots didn't take his sermons as anything other than political rants. But they still liked it. The average, the average festival goer, the average Israelite in the land saw the supernatural power of Christ and got caught up in the messianic hype and they began to connect, connect the dots to the Old Testament prophecies. This is what was happening and swirling around Jerusalem during this week and Israel hated him for it. They have to do something. But it says in verse 45 of chapter 19 of Luke's gospel that Jesus entered the temple and he began to drive out those who were selling, saying to them, it is written, and my house shall be a house of prayer but you have made it a robber's den. And he was teaching daily in the temple, and the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men among them were trying to destroy him, and they couldn't find anything that they might do. Look at this. For all the people were hanging on to every word he said. Jesus, at this point, is the hottest ticket in town. But he comes into Jerusalem and he exposes, first of all, the irreverence of the people who are supposed to be worshipers, true worshipers. There is irreverence. There's no fear of God. They're supposed to be holy as he is holy. And yet there's no fear of God. There was nothing sinful about some of the interactions and transactions that needed to take place at festival time. The merchants would conduct their business on the Kidron Valley's Mount of Olives in time past, but they had moved it now up to the court of the Gentiles on the Temple Mount itself. And they had to have them because as, as the throng of people came to Jerusalem for the sacrifice, there were oxen to be sacrificed and sheep and doves. And you couldn't bring some of those livestock in the journey down to Jerusalem and, or up to Jerusalem. And so animal merchants were there. And then there was a service provided for the exchange of currencies, just like you might see today when we travel. There's a place to exchange currency so that you can have some trade and, and do commerce and business wherever you are, even if you're not that, from that area. These money changers, as it's sometimes called in the translations that we have, they provided a very necessary service. In the Roman Empire, as we've looked at this before, there's, there's all different kinds of coinage. The, the taxes were uh, part of entering into the temple area. If you were 20 years old or older and you were a male, part of the nation of Israel, then you paid that temple tax. You had to use coins that were of silver content, history tells us, Tyrian coins. 
And so you went ahead and exchanged for those. You couldn't use in the temple area any coins with Roman inscriptions. And so you went ahead and exchanged those resources for that which you could use on the temple mount. Listen, there was nothing inherently sinful about providing what was necessary for people. But what had taken place was far different. It wasn't mere irreverence on the Temple Mount. Is that they had trivialized what was holy and what was set apart unto God. They became merchandisers. At every exchange, there was extortion and thievery and stealing going on. There was profiteering and business deals going down that had nothing to do with providing a service. And then there was the mixing of people who came in and had idolatries all over the baggage of their life. And so there was an observing of false religious practices going on. They had become all about the form rather than the substance. They had gotten shallow. They had all the activities, maybe provided some of the services, but their heart was full of greed and selfishness and irreverence. It was for them just duties to perform. For them, it was cold. Their hearts were far from God. There was no worship going on in those that were running the businesses. It was not a service practiced in reverence. It was pragmatism. Sometimes, beloved, I wonder about evangelicalism today. You've seen it over and over again. It seems like one big circus of greed and celebrityism and popularity and cold orthodoxy and joking around and goofing around with the things of the Lord. Love between people is superficial. No one actually talks to anyone about actual things in their conduct with the scriptures open. Because you just don't do that. We're too sophisticated. We know the routine. We go through the motions. We know the practices. I wonder if, if the Lord arrived, would he even find faith on the earth among those who named the name of Christ? It is an important question. Is Jesus Christ our authority? If he says, be holy for I'm holy, are we striving for holiness? Not false piety, not externals, not morality equated with certain rituals and rites and practices, but from the heart. Honest and loving and reverent and transparent and opening God's word and submissive to it. Pliable, soft, humble, reasonable in a sweet sense. Or are we just at times going through the motions with misplaced zeal, form over substance, trivializing holy and profound things? merchandising God's word because we can't get enough of the money of it as we ply our wares and even at times adulterate the word of God for the sake of a dollar. Every generation seems to have problems with this. Jesus comes up to the temple mount and it is terrible and he goes back to the prophet Isaiah in chapter 56 verse 7 and says it is written my house shall be a house of prayer he wasn't merely talking about a quiet serene reverent place where everyone's bowing in prayer he is speaking of the reverence that a person worshiping God has for God himself because God is the authority you remember the first time Jesus ever went into the Temple Mount in his first Passover when he had begun his ministry. He'd been there many times as a child, but he was coming into Jerusalem. John 2 records that he did the same thing and he quoted Psalm 69, 9. Stop making my father's house a house of merchandise. 
The incident brings the issue of authority right back to the forefront. Listen, the Bible tells us that we are God's temple. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Is, is he the authority in your life? Are you as unbelieving as those who watched him do this and began to bring it a challenge to him? It says here that he was teaching daily in the temple during this Passion Week, and the chief priests and the scribes and leading men among the people were trying to destroy him. Israel saw what he was doing, heard what he was saying, and he drove out those who were selling. That must have infuriated them. They could not find anything, verse 48 says, that they might do. For the people were hanging on to every word he said. What a grace from the Lord that the people themselves were not joining in to verse 47. But in verse 48, the people were still hanging on to every word he said. Look, the massive crowds yet had not become so unbelieving in their fickleness and in their shallowness and in their superficiality that they were completely hardened. God was gracious and the crowd was listening to every word. Hanging on it, the verb says. Jesus wasn't concerned about superficial interest. He wasn't concerned about the fickle heart, even though he was mercifully giving them the truth and they were hanging on every word by the work of the Holy Spirit in his grace, in his common grace. Maybe even some were beginning to be drawn to believe, but what Jesus was interested in was the authority of God over lives. He was interested in holiness, a pure heart, an honest heart, a transparent heart. But they challenged him, Israel did, because they had come to the place where they were insolent. You know, sometimes you bring the word of God to bear upon some who claim to be in evangelicalism today, and they are insolent. Some who claim to name the name of Christ and have been evangelicals or Southern Baptists or part of some denomination, Presbyterian or independent Bible church, and they are out there speaking things that are not a part of Scripture. And evangelicals who are honest and transparent and humble and reverent open the Word of God and say it to them. And that person, that teacher, is so popular, so full of themselves, they are insolent and they challenge Anyone who would dare to say something about what they are saying and doing. Well, that's precisely what you have here in chapter 20. On one of the days while he was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders confronted him and they spoke, saying to him, Tell us by what authority you're doing these things, or who is the one who gave you this authority. Notice the emphasis here. While he was teaching the people in the temple, so as they were hanging on every word of what Jesus was saying, and these days that he was teaching... And he was preaching the gospel, which means he was preaching himself. He was preaching grace. He was preaching the work of redemption. He was preaching himself as the one to whom they must cling. He is the bread from which then they will totally satisfy their hunger. He is the water of life from which their thirst would be ultimately quenched. He's preaching himself. And the leaders of Israel, chief priests, scribes, elders, they confronted him. And notice the emphasis they spoke saying to him, what is emphasized here by Luke is that this particular group that should know their Messiah, they should have come under the authority of the scriptures. That group, group is the similar one as in, described in Luke 19.47, the major Social elements of the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin, you know, for those of you who perhaps haven't been with our study, 71 members led by the high priest. The chief priests were members of the leading high priestly families, and they held all these offices, the ruler of the temple, the leaders of the weekly and daily groups of priests, the captains of the treasurers. And then he includes here, Luke does, the elders. They were the, the lay representatives of the people, 
they are the, the ones who come alongside the people and sort of make the connection between the authority of the Sanhedrin and the people. This is a high-powered group, but you see their insolence here. Tell us. The subject is implied. You tell us. We are the authority. You tell us by what authority you are doing these things or who's the one who gave you this authority. The leadership held the only positions of authority for regulating what happens in the Temple Mount, and they knew that. Among the people, they were the ones who say what goes on in the Temple Mount. Jesus had just run off the, the merchandisers. They hadn't commissioned Jesus to do any such thing, the Sanhedrin. The leaders of Israel had said nothing. The only one who could override the authority of the Sanhedrin in the temple would have to be the Messiah, God himself in human flesh, the Christ, the anointed one. And they'd already decided, Jesus of Nazareth, he's no Messiah. And they wanted to do something that would expose Jesus as some zealot, some insurrectionist who defied rightful authorities. And they thought with, that with this challenge, they'd have him in a corner as some sort of unlawful intruder into the religious life of the people. Here he is on the Temple Mount. Oh, okay, he'd been doing it in the wilderness, and he'd been doing it in synagogues and villages. And a couple years ago, he was on the Temple Mount, but we'd gotten rid of that and moved him along. And we forced his ministry out of the heart of it. And now he dares to come to the Temple Mount. And I want to know by what authority he's doing these things. What insolence. But Jesus, when he answers them, he puts a simple question to them. And it is, of course, a profound cross-examination. Verse 3, Jesus answered and said to them, I'll ask you a question, and you tell me. Now, when Jesus raises this question, he is reaching back to their claim, as we'll see in a moment, that the prophets are the authority of God's voice in Israel. Even though the scriptures say they'd killed the prophets many times, even though they'd made no bones about their own personal authority and autonomy, whenever it was convenient, they reached back and said, we listen to the Old Testament. Our Abraham is our father, they'd told Jesus. We listen to the prophets. We listen to Moses. So Jesus is going to test them on that very issue. I'll ask you a question and you tell me. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Literally, it could be, it could read, was the baptism of John, what was the origin of that commanded by God authoritatively? Was it from the authority of God himself or from men? Was he a prophet sent from God to renew Israel unto repentance? To be the forerunner to the Messiah. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Did it just come from, the, from some quack out in the wilderness who came up and said he was a prophet? This, this beloved demonstrates exactly what happened every time when they got into some debate with Jesus. He would bring with utter simplicity and an economy of divine language, he just hit them with brilliance. You wonder by now why they're even asking him any questions in public. Here's Jesus' tactic. He is, he is saying to them, okay, you're demanding my credentials, my authority. So, I'm going to question your view of the credentials of my primary witness. I'm going to ask you about my primary witness. 
Because if you're going to ask me for my credentials so that you can say with what authority I am doing the things I'm doing, I'm going to first ask you to answer about my primary witness. I'm going to ask you about his credentials. See, any answer they give is very, very challenging. It's a thorny issue because it exposes, it's going to expose their duplicity regarding Jesus' authority. It's convenient for them to challenge his authority when they already have said very little, if not, you know, endorsing the prophetic voice. Now, surely being self-proclaimed experts in the matters of theology, they would relish the opportunity to debate the issues, he's just from Nazareth, this Jesus. He's just a backwater guy from Nazareth. We know his parents. They'd said it all along to the crowd. Surely they would love an opportunity to debate him right here in public. Not on your life. They are a committee of the arrogant and unbelieving. They believe in their own authority and they are literally stumped here. Look at verse 5. They reasoned among themselves. So here's their little sidebar. Well, if we say from heaven, then he'll say, why did you not believe in him? Why did you not believe him? Look, if you say John's baptism is from heaven, he's sent from God, then if he witnessed about me, why are you not believing his witness? But if we say he's just from men, we're going to be committing a capital offense because he has been affirmed as a bona fide prophet. These leaders of the spiritual well-being of Israel are in a sidebar and they see the dilemma with which they have been trapped. It is inescapable. This, with one small short question, is checkmate. They had to pull together. <laughs> they reasoned. They, they collected themselves together and brought it to mind. This was to look at the premises and start to look at it from each side. Jesus clearly would ask them why they didn't believe in John's witness and therefore not believe in Jesus. You know what that implies? You're hypocrites. Because you claim that he was from God and then you reject the one he prophesied about. You're inconsistent. You're duplicitous. You're hypocrites. For convenience sake, you will gladly please the people in the affirmation that John was a prophet. But I was the one he spoke about. Just look at it. Look at the Old Testament. Look at John's witness. Look at the pointing that he did to me. Look how he moved the crowds to me. Look how I affirmed him as the one who announced me. He's the forerunner. And they would have also been admitting that Jesus' authority was from heaven. And there was the crux of the issue. It would have revealed their hearts deep down that they do not believe and follow God like they claim. Jesus had said, and is recorded in Matthew 21, verse 32, For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you didn't believe him. But the tax gatherers and the harlots did believe him. And you, when you saw that, didn't even feel remorse afterwards so as to believe in him. That's right. John came to you in the way of righteousness. You didn't believe John's witness, but then the tax gatherers and harlots did believe him. So now you are willing to admit John was an official prophet. A modern-day Elijah who came to announce the Messiah. Why? It was convenient for you. You don't want to lose the witness of the people. You don't want to lose the loyalty of the people. So you're not going to deny John's ministry and divine testimony. Because you know you'll be charged by the people with a capital offense, removed from your position, and likely stoned by the populace because John the Baptist was accepted as the modern day Elijah returned to announce the Messiah. Verse 7 says, so they answered that they did not know where it came from. <laughs> they didn't know. Yeah, of course, you, of course you're going to answer like that. 
because you're trapped by your own unbelief? It's, it's the safe answer. It's, we might call it the slimy answer. At the most, they answer like this. They don't sound like they've conferred enough. It's a sidebar that didn't result in any real, in any real argument for the debate. So they might have a few confused people who might see them as weak. But, but even if a few question their integrity and their wisdom, it's far better than publicly admitting that they reject the people's prophet and his message. So, Jesus said, you came in here and you demanded my credentials and my authority, the basis for it. I ask you first, in the debate, to tell me where John's witness is from. Is it from heaven or is it from men? You tell me you don't know. Verse 8, Jesus said to them, nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. If you're not willing to face the inescapable conclusions about yourself for having rejected the divine authority of God's messenger who pointed to me, then you, listen, you forfeit the right to challenge me as to whether I'm the one he bore witness to. Why? Because it exposes that the rejection is already there. If you reject John the Baptist, you already reject me. If you accept John the Baptist, you must accept me. And because you won't answer, it is proof. And so Jesus puts it to them. Don't come here and publicly ask me for proof of authority when privately in your heart you've already rejected me by rejecting the messengers whom God sent to preach about me. So on the outside, you claim that you accept the people's affirmation of John the Baptist and his message. But on the inside, you don't care about his message because he spoke of me and you hate me. And that's revealing. Jesus just exposes them. And then he confronts them with a parable. Notice verse 9 began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it out to vine growers, and went on a journey for a long time. And at the harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine growers so that they would give him some of the produce of the vineyard. But the vine growers beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he proceeded to send another slave, and they beat him also and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he proceeded to send a third, and this one they also wounded and cast out. And the owner of the vineyard said, what am I going to do? I'll send my beloved son. Perhaps they'll respect him. And when the vine growers saw him, they reasoned with one another saying, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance will be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Well, he would come and destroy these vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, may it never be. Jesus looked at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. We're going to look at that parable next week, but you get the point. Jesus sent prophets, God sent prophets to announce that the Messiah would come. And they beat those prophets, treated them shamefully, and sent them away empty-handed. And then he sent his son with the message of redemption and reconciliation. And they said, this is the heir, we hate him. We will have what we want when we want it, the way we want it. We will climb up on our own. We will be sons without him. And the owner said, destroy him. Give the vineyard to others. This is exactly what happened to Israel. They were hardened, Romans, 12, Romans 11 says. They were hardened for a time because they did not recognized their time of visitation. They did not listen to the prophets. They did not 
submit to the authority of the scriptures. They did not come under with pliable hearts, the word of the living God. And when Christ arrived on the earth, their heart was hard to it. Listen, beloved, if you do not have a softness to scripture, if you do not have a pliability before your God with reverence and fear, it isn't that you'll perfectly obey it as Christians. Of course not. But you must check your heart if the authority, the absolute authority of Christ is not the greatest comfort and joy to your life. The authority of his word, the authority of what he says, the authority to cleanse, the authority to say what is true, the authority to say what worship is, the authority to say what obedience is, the authority to say what holiness is, the authority to tell you who's in and who's out, the authority to tell you who's going to have the kingdom and who isn't, the authority to tell you how one enters the kingdom and one, how one is lost and outside the kingdom. Jesus Christ alone has the authority, and at his name, Lord of all, every knee will bow. If you're listening to this, and you have up to this point been a skeptic, or you've mocked Christianity, you've laughed at Claims made by Jesus in Scripture? You've questioned whether he even existed? If you're listening to this and you ultimately have, have scoffed at the message of the gospel, at calls to repent of your self-worship and self-interest and autonomy, which is no autonomy at all, you are under your holy God and will answer. If you've had a Christian friend or a Christian family member and all you've thought is how can they be so radically concerned with what the Bible says in that ancient book and you've scratched your head in skepticism and you've maybe even brought your own insolent challenge, I will not believe until you prove it to me. Listen, my friend, you're like the Pharisees on the Temple Mount. By what authority do you do these things, Jesus? Well, listen, if you don't believe the scriptures by faith that what it says about sinners and their need is true, you're lost. Utterly lost. And you must throw yourself on the mercy of God. Because the day will come when he will come in all of his power and authority as judge. Ebenezer Pemberton finished his sermon about the authority of Christ with these words. All mankind shall be summoned before him. No sooner shall the judge descend to this lower world and erect his throne in the air, but they who are in their graves shall be awakened out of the sleep of death, and all the inhabitants of the world will be cited to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And the voice of the archangel and the chief of the heavenly host shall echo through the wide creation and penetrate into the secret caverns of the earth. At this mighty sound, the dead shall start out of their dusty beds and all the descendants of Adam shall be compelled to obey the call. Those who are alive shall be immediately changed and prepared to make their personal appearance at the bar of their judge. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the scriptures say. Civil distinctions make a mighty sound among men, and persons of superior wealth and power are admired and applauded like so many deities by their servile flatterers. Hence, they are apt to swell with pride upon the account of their elevated circumstances, and they vainly hope that they shall be treated with deference and respect at the future judgment. And they flatter themselves that God will not be strict to mark iniquity in men of their dignity and station. 
but that he will make some favorable allowances for the excesses and follies which are so common among men of estate in the world. But alas, these are vain imaginations. The sovereign ruler of the world pays no regard to earthly greatness, neither has he any value for those distinctions which are made by birth and estate. The great potentates of the earth who are cried up as gods by deluded mortals are in his sight but contemptible worms of the dust. And in that day they will be divested of all their stately ornaments, deprived of the signs of their greatness and power, and stand upon a level with the lowest slave. Death, the universal conqueror, pays no compliments to their quality, but arrests them without ceremony or respect, and their impartial judge will irresistibly summon them to his tremendous bar. And even those who've made no figure among men but have spent their days in obscurity, will not be overlooked in the vast assembly, but will be strictly examined whether they've submitted to the wise disposals of providence and improved the talents committed to their trust. Those who are in the morning of their youth and in the strength and vigor of their age shall be brought into judgment for their unmindfulness of their great creator and their criminal indulgence of sensual pleasures. Ignorant, uninstructed heathens who have inhabited the wild and desolate corners of the earth will be called to account for transgression of the law of nature and their abuse of the divine goodness. And the learned and civilized nations who have been favored with the light of the gospel and early instructed in the will of heaven must answer for their superior advantages and their neglect of the means of grace and salvation, such as will not now approach the throne of divine mercy, must then appear at the bar of inflexible justice. He finishes with this statement. What a grand and solemn sight will this be to behold all the successive generations of men standing together in their respective orders and waiting for their decisive trial. That is a description of what the Bible says will be when the Lord of glory himself the judge of all men, the judge of all mankind will be answered. And we will stand before him. And the Pharisees on the Temple Mount that day will be there. And they will not only not have an answer to some question about what the prophets said, But John's witness will be there to testify against them. Today, the witness of this sermon will be there to testify against you if you don't believe. Don't waste another day in spiritual quarantine. Don't do it. Come out into the freedom of the grace of God. Call upon Him in His mercy. And if if you've already done that and you are in Christ... Listen, beloved, we're called to come under the authority of Christ. He's our authority for everything. Don't selectively read his word. Submit to it. Wisdom from above. Own it. Honest. Rejoicing. Willing. What a sweet day that will be for those who are in Christ. No judgment for sin which is all paid for in the Lord Jesus at the cross. That parable we'll unpack next time. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the profound truth coming from this circumstance when men decided in the arrogance of their unbelieving hearts to challenge your authority. I think, Lord, about the fact that ever since I've come to Christ, and this is true for every true believer, we, we have ways that we, we don't obey your word, the authority of your word. We don't listen to the authority of your word. And those are, in and of themselves, fleshly challenges to those things. But deep in our hearts, by the power and mercy of your spirit, we do love your authority. 
We do long for the security of it, to bask in the sweetness of your word, the power of your love, the benevolent sovereignty of your greatness and your majesty. And even though you are judge, we know that you could have judged us, but you took upon yourself wrath of your Father that we might not be judged so that we might know by faith this sweet authority that you have in our lives. You're our Lord. That's what it means to call you Lord. Master, we are your unworthy slaves and we love you as sons. We love you as those who are part of your family. We've been made a part of your family, but we love your authority and we know the duty of it and we rejoice in that. Lord, may we always be pliable and soft. We call upon you to be merciful to those who have not been pliable and soft, but please draw them in your mercy. Lord, help us to stay focused on the right things when we can't meet together. There's such great reminders in meeting together, such great grace in being together as a people in our services, there are, so many, there are so many ministries that happen in our hearts because you have given us one another, face to face, up close, fellowshipping. And we haven't been able to have that the way we have been used to. So give us wisdom and urgency and fervency and alertness and to gird up our minds for action and be sober, to love one another fervently. We thank you for the privilege. In our Savior's name we pray. Amen.